can use the properties of Fourier optics to do some interesting image analysis uh, in a simple setup and classic experiment that we'll perform in lab. The idea is that if you have an image, perhaps printed on a, a transparency uh, so that you could illuminate it with light and then image it uh, further down the line, that image uh, can be described in terms of its two-dimensional Fourier transform. And so um, we can visualize that with some two-dimensional plot. And you can, for example, go into MATLAB, take an image from a camera, load it into memory, form a two-dimensional Fourier transform, and plot that. And you'll typically see something that uh, you know, has certain spectral properties that you can recognize. And oftentimes, it looks like a, a bunch of garbage centered here at low frequencies. Well, when we uh, create that image with light, we're essentially using uh, light of different spatial frequencies overlapping to produce that image. That's exactly what a Fourier transform is. And so that means there are uh, spatial frequencies of light in the x and y direction. And for any point on this two-dimensional Fourier transform plot, that represents two different spatial frequencies right, in the y direction and the x direction. And for those spatial frequencies, there's a particular amplitude. And at other spatial frequencies, we get different amplitudes. And of course, it's the sum of all of those different uh, transverse waves that add up to produce that image. Well, what does that mean in the context of optics? We would typically think of um, a optics experiment that illuminates or produces this image as maybe something like this. We've got a laser. expand it to some size, we illuminate this slide, and then we can place a, a screen at some point, and if the beam is well collimated, we can observe, observe our image. So what does it mean to have uh, wave components in the transverse direction? Uh, it would appear that our optical beam is propagating along the uh, optical axis, which I'll call Z. Well, uh, in fact, it is primarily propagating along Z, meaning it has a particular K vector two pi over lambda that is along Z. But after the collimated light goes through this image, uh, goes through this mass, that mass must introduce spatial frequency components in X and Y. That is to say, it diffracts the light and introduces some transverse components to its momentum vector. Okay, so I'll just draw the uh, Y component. The X component would be out of the board, and this becomes difficult to draw. But whatever Y components that I expect to have from the Fourier transform, that Y component manifests itself over here as an additional momentum component to the light that results in there being a component to the light that makes up this image that is propagating at an angle, right, that's diffracted by this object. And the angle is typically small if the features on this object are large compared to a wavelength, because this k vector is 2 pi over, I'll call it a, where a is the spatial scale of the structure that caused that particular diffraction. And so if a over lambda is large, then we expect theta to be small. 
And so there are lots of different uh, wave components propagating at different angles, and the sum of them over here produce this image of this object. Um, that's a fairly simplistic view of what's going on. Uh, it neglects the fact that uh, the beam, as it spreads out, will cause this object to lose focus. So we can now add in a few optics. We could add a single lens here, such that we've got an object distance and an image distance to our screen. This lens uh, we'll call a thin lens of focal length f. And the rate relation between the object and image distance obeys the standard uh, Gaussian uh, imaging formula. And if we do that, uh, we'll indeed see that image in focus on our screen. But something interesting happens. If we consider all of the uh, wave components that are propagating at a certain angle, that's because of diffraction, uh, and that represents all of the Fourier components at a certain height in this, in this uh, plot of the Fourier transform, all the spatial components that propagate at a certain angle are going to be focused at one focal length away from the lens. And then they reach the screen and interfere with the waves propagating at other angles. And over here at the screen, I have all the light that passed through this mass overlapping and producing this, this uh, image. But at the focal plane, or one focal distance away from my lens, I have all the different spatial frequency components separated spatially. And so that's a very powerful thing to have because it means that I can put a mask in here and say selectively block out certain spatial frequency components. That's equivalent to removing the features in this image that come from diffraction of a particular period structure in this object. So for example, if this object is made up of lines from, say, an inkjet printer, where the printhead isn't quite aligned and you see a series of lines, if I don't do any spatial filtering, I would expect my image have that same series of lines on it. And those lines might be due or might cause diffraction at a particular angle. And so by putting in a, a mask to block the light in the Fourier transform plane right here, where that, uh, that particular type of diffraction has all the light pass through, I can remove those lines from my image. I can do much more complicated things than that. I can pass only the central region of rays in this Fourier transform plane. And that's equivalent to only passing the central region of this uh, Fourier transform plot. That's a spatial low-pass filter. It's going to have the effect of blurring this image. Well, if I do the opposite, if I allow only the bundle of rays that pass through the edge of this Fourier transform plane to pass, that's essentially passing only the high spatial frequency components, the light that's been uh, steeply diffracted by this object. That's going to come from hard edges. And that's going to essentially produce all the outlines 
of the, the features in my image without any of the, uh, the low-level background. So it's like doing an edge detect in Photoshop. Now, one of the challenges in doing this is if you set this up with just whatever lens is available, uh, the image plane and the Fourier transform plane may be very close together, and it might be difficult to work uh, over such short distances. This might be one or two millimeters. So we have an additional degree of freedom. We can add a second lens. And if we add a second lens right here, I'll call this F1 and this F2. If we add it right where the object is, then it doesn't change the apparent object position, as seen by this lens. But it does produce an intermediate Fourier transform plane. one focal length away from that lens. Sort of like this. And that allows us to do our filtering at this transform plane, which is one focal length away. Now, in practice, uh, we rarely can put this lens right on top of our image, uh, or, or of our object, because we typically have some uh, spatial limitations due to the constraints of the mounts that we use. So, um, you can use any combination of two lenses that are chosen such that the Fourier transform plane of the first lens is easily accessible, and the image produced by the second lens is in focus on your screen. But a particularly straightforward combination to use is the first lens, it's F1, that is spaced one focal length away from our object. And in terms of the imaging of this object, the Gaussian lens formula tells us that a pair of rays leaving a point on the object is going to come out parallel because of the location of this lens. And then we can place the second lens, which is focal length F2, that will focus those rays down to a point one focal length away. So this distance here is F2, and that's where we put our screen. And then we'd expect to see our image. at the screen. Now, I've drawn all the rays emanating from a point on my object to trace the image location in the system. But if I consider all the rays that are at a particular angle, that will allow me to uh, understand what's going to happen in terms of the Fourier transform. Since the rays at different angles are at at any given angle, correspond to the Fourier frequency component of my image. And so, parallel rays converge one focal length away from a lens. So my Fourier transform plane, FT, my Fourier transform plane is going to be located one focal length away from my first lens. And if my first lens is one focal length away from my object, then my final image will be one focal length away from the second lens. And in this geometry, this length here, L, doesn't matter. It affects a little bit the amount of light that gets gathered, and so the brightness of the final image. But it allows us to completely decouple the location of the Fourier transform plane from the location of the final image so that we can put those both at convenient locations on our optical table so that we can stick in some filters here and see what effect they have on the final image.